Well, hello everyone. I think the doors will probably flap open and close as people come in from having their little breaks. This has been a tremendous day so far. Can I just say thank you to everybody who's been coming up and having a conversation as well. Um, there are brilliant stories throughout this whole room. People who have come to emotional intelligence through really different paths. Some people who, I was meeting a lady earlier, who very recently has just left a job that she was in for a very, very long time and uh, built up gradually, gradually the courage to, to leave because she had this calling. She just felt that there was something that had more purpose, more meaning in her life, and she wanted to do that with it. And she's done it. Um, Woohoo! And, uh, and I was talking to another gentleman before who um, was desperate to know um, what my toddler was like during the day when I mentioned that he went to forest school. And he said, Did he get, does he get dirty? Yeah, he gets dirty. Do you put the clothes in the wash? I didn't expect these questions. I didn't expect... Um, I do, and yes, it did break the washing machine. So I'm glad I'm not alone in that. It's been lovely to meet so many people. Um, we have um, a couple of talks now on the stage, and then we're going to have another breakout with some more of the workshop sessions, which have been brilliant so far. I learned something um, that's being taught in some schools. Have you heard this? Go snot. Anybody? <laughs> Seemingly. It was from you, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's about gaining autonomy, and as long as children can do that from a very young age, then they can take it on through the rest of their lives. And what it stands for is S is self, N is neighbor, O is opposite, T is teacher. And what the idea is, if you've got a problem in class that you can't solve, you look within yourself, you go to your neighbor, you go to the kid opposite you, and then you'd end up going to the teacher. And it means that the, the whole class ends up working together. And it can change the way that education happens in a really positive way. I thought that was wonderful. Um, and also a very energetic class with Catherine and Alaria as well. And uh, the actors who are involved in that deserved an Oscar. Talking of which, our next guy. I've got a question for you. Feel happy to answer this. Has anybody ridden a dragon? <clears throat> Has anyone been the hero fighting against John Malkovich? <laughs> Who here has played a self-confessed cocky wind-up merchant <laughs> under Dame Maggie Smith? Who here has been an Irish smuggler, a Tudor royal relative, and battled zombies and werewolves? Are you here? You are. Yes, Ed Spilliers, star of the movie Aragon, part of the award-winning Downton Abbey team, of course. And the question is, how on earth does he navigate all of those worlds, some real, some fake, and his own home life as well, but how does he bring in time traveling with emotional intelligence to make a successful career out of this. So we're going to find out with the help of Ross Grant, who, of course, as an actor and coach and many other things, can help lead us through this. So let's welcome Ed and Ross to the stage. Give you a clap, Ed. I'll give you a clap as well, Ross. Give you a clap. <laughs> Good afternoon. Every is, is this mic on? I can, yes, I can hear myself it now. It definitely is, Ross. It this is a little bit like is. Parkinson. So we are filling the after dinner Slots. So I know a lot of people who put your hand up if you had a dessert. Be honest. Put your hand. There's a lot of people who are not being very honest right now. Put your hand up if you had a dessert. Well, you know, we've, we've got a fight on then, Ross. Exactly. This we're going to try and g everybody up. There's some directors. Ken Loach, famous director, does not let his lead actors have dessert at lunch because it brings people's energy down a little bit. They get a bit sluggish after dinner. So hopefully we're going to bring your energy back up. It's a little bit di dictatorial, that, though, isn't it? I suppose. I'm a big fan of Loach, but that's a bit controlling. Ken, if you're watching, yeah. Ed is not having a job. <laughs> um, so good afternoon. Massively excited to be here. My name's Ross. Uh, I'm an actor as well and a presenter. And for the last eight years, I've been running a really large community in the acting industry. Um, act on this, the TV Actors Network, actonthis.tv. If you're an actor or you want to be an actor, come and get involved. Um, but I've sat down on a weekly basis with some of the most successful actors, writers, directors, um, producers, execs. We're talking Oscar winners, BAFTA winners, Emmy Award winners. Um, some huge names in the industry. Every week I record a podcast with these people and we reverse engineer what it is that has led to their success. And every story is very, very different. But one thing 
I think, that is a, is a thread that runs throughout all of those interviews, um, ultimately is emotional intelligence. As actors, we develop an emotional intelligence that maybe, I don't know, we're not even aware of a lot of the time. I don't think actors even realize mm. this is what they're doing, but an ability to be aware of their emotions, um, understand their emotions, um, control their emotions, and then be able to express their emotions on set or on stage. And you're juggling, obviously, those in your work and those in your life. So that's what we're going to be talking about with Ed during this session. We asked people at last night's dinner to tweet us, ask Ed EQ, the hashtag. And we pulled out probably four. We're going to do four tweets, Ed. And then I'm going to throw the ball out, because I think for the last 10 minutes, we'll just get some. It's going to obviously uh, you know, uh, stir some questions in the room, and we're going to you know, go live and, um, and hopefully give you guys as much value as possible. So thank you to everybody who has tweeted. Um, I'm going to bring up the first question, and we'll get stuck in, man. Perfect. Give as much value as possible. So yeah. shout out, first of all, to Ian Trotter. Is he, is he in the room? Yes, Ian. So Ian Asad, and this is a big issue for a lot of actors, but also a lot of people in the room, this applies to everybody. How do you manage the gap between a project finishing and a new production starting? So ultimately for an actor, like the peaks and the troughs, you'll be on a high one minute, mm. you're in Aragon, you're in this huge film, you've been flown first class around the world, you've been treated like a king, and then bang, you, your job finishes and you're dropped back down to earth. As an, on an EQ level, how do you deal with that gap? Uh, I mean, I th that's, a, that's a good question. I think, taking the example of Aragon, that, was, uh, that came at a time when I was, I was 17 years old and I was thrust into this environment of doing a $100 million movie and I'd never been in front of a camera before. Uh, and the, 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 the low on the back of that was, was quite catastrophic. Right? It took me a long time, actually, as a, as a human, let alone as an actor, to uh, um, trust myself enough to have enough strength to, to, to cope with the, the um, you know, the, the lows, I suppose, and the being out of work. And it, it, it has taken, it takes time to get a thick skin to be able to handle that. To the point now where, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm sort of a 31 year old man with, with two children and I, I am literally just begun the next supposed trough. I don't know when the next gig is at the moment. Uh, I've just finished a big, big job on Outlander and there is always, there is always, no matter what job I do, there's always an element of post-production blues. You can't escape it. And I actually think you have to embrace it a little bit. You have to go and look at what are those, what are those positives that I've, I've taken from that job? What have, what have I enjoyed about it? What have I enjoyed about working with, with certain individuals, whether it be the director, the cast members, producers? What did I do on those, those jobs that maybe I could work on next time around? Uh, and I, I'm a big believer in, in trying to leave no stone unturned. In my profession, there are, there are certain elements that are out of my control to an extent. You know, there are, I, I, I have an agent. I have to rely on people to, to, to potentially put work on the table for me. But there are certain things I, I, I can do. I can, I can be looking after myself mentally, physically. I can, you know, can be doing like the, most, the simplest thing. I know not everybody has children, but I have two wonderful children. I can make sure that when I'm out of work, I'm focusing on them and giving them everything I can. So when the next job comes around, there's not this, this stress about needing to have I put enough time into my children. Um, and, it, and it's also, I think, it's, 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 it's being aware of other things in your industry. I, I don't know what you, what you do, Ian, but it's trying to, uh, for me, it's looking at, I'm constantly looking at other films, constantly looking at other, other, other plays, reading, writing. I, I think that a lot of actors, when they are in the, in the sort of troughs, they quite often um, use boredom as a, as a get out. And they think, oh, I'm bored and I'll do this. And, you know, and, and, and I'll be honest, when I, I used to be very much the same. And it was, you know, I'd be bored and my go-to would be to go to the pub, like a lot of actors do. Um, and don't get me wrong, I like a beer, but like, I think that it's, it can be very destructive. And it's knowing that, there's, for me, I don't think there is any such thing as boredom. There is always something you can be doing as an individual. It's always something. It doesn't matter what it is. It, whatever, it, you know, whatever your, your fail-safes are, whether it be, right, first thing in the morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go for a run, whether it be I need to read for, you know, for an hour, whether it be the, the simplest things of getting your life in order. But I think there's always something you can be doing. There's no, you, it doesn't mean you have to constantly be on gear five, 100%, uh, you know, achieving, achieving, achieving. I don't think that's what it's about, but I think you can always be exercising your mind and exercising your body and keeping yourself, you know, as, as, as supple as possible. Excellent. Uh, yeah, and I think from, from my perspective, I'll just expand on that, Ed, is um, there's two ways you can look at it when you're in a trough. You can be on the defensive or you can be yeah. on the offensive. And I think 
one way to avoid those troughs in my own career has been whilst I'm in a job, is to be looking for that next opportunity. Yeah. And whether that's working with your agent, you know, broadening your network, nurturing those relationships. A lot of our industry is built and predicated on the quality of your relationships. And I was saying to Ed before, there's a difference between, people say it's who you know, I don't think it is, I think it's who knows you. If, if we're you know, building uh, relationships with casting directors, there's a difference between me going, oh yeah, I know that casting director. If I walk past them in the street, would they stop and, and actually acknowledge me? That's the difference between me knowing them and them knowing me. So I think the more offensive you can be when you are in those troughs, or if there's a pattern emerging, I think Ian, we were saying last night, there's a month of the year for you that is always a trough, and you've seen this pattern over the last 21 years. Yeah. I'm like, well, if we know that's coming, then what can we use that trough for? And we can be on the offensive um, as opposed to you know, being on the defensive. Um, and what would you say about taking accountability for those troughs? Another big thing I coach actors on is like, if you're not working with that, I don't want to sound brutal, but it's within your control. It's like, it is, if you take full accountability, it is your fault. It's not your agent's fault. It's not a director's fault. It's not a casting director's fault. If you pull all that power back to yourself and say, I'm not working, thus it's my fault, you feel you can then do something about it. I think to an extent, I think, I mean, I... I, I... It comes back to that sort of no stone unturned element, you know. I, th I think, uh, as an actor, you know, you'd be going up for in, in that trough. You could that could last three months, six months. I mean, I had one a couple of years ago that I didn't work for nine months, and that gets that gets a bit hairy when you've got, you know, it doesn't matter w w at what point you are in your career. Anyone not working for nine months is is a, is a tough thing to handle, and to sort of maintain your self worth and to and and trust you. There's only there's, there's certain, you get to a point where there's certain things you keep telling yourself that. that Feel like they're not working, but I, I do, I do believe that if you if you are doing everything you can in those opportunities, then you're 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 holding you're able to hold your head high, and you know that you're you know you don't want to be that person going I should have done more of that, I should I should I could have done a bit more there, I could have adjusted that, I could have you know you can always look at how you can improve. There's no harm in that, but I think to an, you you need to be able you don't want to be thinking I I I should have done a bit more basically. That's what I, nice. I Hope that helps. A little bit, Ian. We're going to move on to uh, Bill Scott OBE. Bill Scott OBE in the house. Question says, how do you emotionally... Oh, okay, it's interesting. How do you emotionally connect with your audiences? So I guess there's people in here who will be going in to present to people who they've never met before, pitch for contracts, etc. It's different maybe from being on screen where it's being recorded to being in a theater where it's live right now. Hopefully we'll try to connect with the audience in here. How do you ensure you connect with the audience? Uh, I suppose today's quite a good test, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I think there's, 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 uh, there's two different forms in acting, isn't there? There's, there's, there's the theater or there's TV and film. Uh, purely from, a, uh, from an artistic point of view, I need to know my, my work, my script inside out. If I, if I don't know what I, ha I have to do, character uh, inside out, what I've tried to achieve. Mike's all over the place, I'm gonna do that. Um, blame the tools. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, you know, for, from a theater point of view, if there's, there's two things in, in play. One, that you know, I know that people have come in and they've paid good money to sit in the audience and to be there. And it doesn't matter if there's 400 people in the audience or 30. I was doing a play tour last year with, with, with Matt Horn. We were doing Rain Man. That was a, it actually came up here with the, the second part of the tour, I think. Um, and it was you know, obviously a hugely iconic film with big, big themes. Uh, you know, covering autism and loss and, and greed and, and relationships. And there was a plethora of things we could sort of connect with, but I also knew that, you know, if we had to go out in front of an audience that, it didn't matter if it was 400 people out there or 30 people out on a, on a Saturday afternoon matinee, you have to deliver and you have to do it for them. And you, you know, if, and as well as you, as, no, as long as you've done your work inside out and you know, you know your objectives from a, from a character point of view, you know what you want to achieve as an actor, um, then you can put it onto your, onto your audience. You know, because essentially, from, from my point of view, there are the audiences that, who are watching the TV shows I'm in or the plays I, I, I'm in, they are the ones who, who, who pay me, essentially. They're the ones who drive me to getting my next jobs, you know, and I, you, you owe a huge amount to them. So putting it in a, you know, and I think that's, that's having empathy with your audience and, and understanding them and understanding what they want based on, based on the script, based on the content of, of, of the story you're trying to tell. 
I think you have, and that's, so that's sort of about having a really good grasp of what you have to, have to do. And enjoying it as well. One of the things as an actor, you, you have to enjoy being up there. You, you know, and I think if you're presenting, if you, I, I mean, I don't work in, in the business sense in the same way as many of you do, but I, I, would, I, I feel that if you're, if you're if, even if you struggle with that enjoyment element and you, you find it stressful or, or nerve-wracking to be up on stage, then you, you just have to think that you're there for a reason. There's a reason why you are in, there, in, that, in that situation, whether it be some of these fantastic speakers today. Now, I, I haven't spoken to everybody who's spoken today, but I'm sure if I did in, in individually, I'm sure a couple of you would say there might be an element of nerves before going in. I might be wrong, but there might be some sort of anticipation. Um, it was a lovely lady speaking before before lunch, um, Lara, I think it was, and they were talking about uh, you were talk, talking about things going wrong the night before. Now that happens in in plays and film sets all the time. There's always circumstances that, get, that sort of force you to have to change, and and you were saying you sort of you, it was kind of. Um, with great sort of, uh, Pizzazz was saying, you, know, you threw it all out the window. But although you were saying that you threw it all out the window, you still knew that you, you had the truth of what you wanted to do at the same time. And I think that's important for all of us, is that you, know, you, have, to enjoy, you have to enjoy being up there and, and, and rise to the challenge. And we can all do that, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's supposed to be, it's really interesting. It's, acting is supposed to be enjoyable. Your job is supposed to be enjoyable. It's not, um, some people say to us, oh, you know, you're so lucky to be doing what you love. And I'm like, well, it's not lucky in terms of, I don't think that, I think it's everybody's right to be doing a job that they love. And I think most people who are here have realized that at some point in their life. And now you are in businesses or running your own businesses and you've decided to stop building other people's dreams and start building your own. Um, but a lot of actors find the process of getting work and stuff torturous in terms of the audition process. And sometimes you've got to come back and go, why did I get into this in the first place? What have I lost? that I had as a child and this imagination and all this playfulness that suddenly I've come into the business and it's become way more stressful. Um, so it's about, um, yeah, remembering kind of why, why you're doing it. And then a uh, the couple of points said to expand, you said before as well, when we were talking about engaging with audiences, how important it is to listen. Acting is all about listening, all about reacting to the person, responding to the person you're opposite. So listening and specificity, you said. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in any line of work, uh, and, and, and any field, and to be fair, in, in some respects, in any relationship, uh, I think specificity is important because it ties into honesty. If you're if you're if you're being specific about, you know, what you've got to do, what you want to get across, then you're only going to be helping the other person you're you're working with. And with acting, you have to be specific. You have to. You can't be vague. You can't be vague with an emotion in an acting. I can't look at a script and go, "This guy's sort of feeling this." He's sort of thinking this, because it doesn't mean anything. You, you need to be very sort of definite, I think. And I think that applies to everyday life. I, I, you know, I, again, I, I know I'm sort of repeating myself. That's because I'm not an expert. So, um, but I feel that, you know, I, th I think you, you do need that. And, and, and actually, thinking about it sitting here, how often does that happen? When you are specific with people and you're honest with people, you nine times out of ten seem to get a, either a better response or, 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 or a more, more, you know, a more honest feeling back it might not always be what you want to hear but it might it actually is more constructive in the in the long run and I think that's the same with you know with acting when preparing specificity is huge specificity is hugely important you mentioned listening Ross I mean that's what we have to do all day long you can't I was talking to a, a guy Steve outside just a moment ago and we were was talking about listening and responding and that is you know the, the sort of school of thought I come with with acting is based on a guy called Sanford Meisner mainly and his sort of fundamental belief is all about listening and responding I think we have to do that all day long anyway, but I think with acting, it is, you know, I may come into a scene with a preordained idea about how I want to play that scene out and what I want my character to, to give. Now, but the actor I'm working with on the day may throw something completely different to how I've interpreted their reading of the, you know, what I think that character should be doing. Now, if I shut down and go, well, that's not, that's not, that doesn't work with me, that, then, then the whole scene sort of just disintegrates and it has no life and then there's, there's no truth. If I listen to what they're going, to what they're offering, and respond, I, it doesn't have to sort of be uh, disingenuous to my own work, and I can just throw something back for giving an honest response. Yeah, I think with honesty as well um, leads nicely into this into this next question because it's all about something we all feel, regardless of the industry we're in. It's all about rejection. As actors, we go for probably if we're lucky, and our agents are doing their job, and we're doing ours, and you know we're leveraging our network and stuff, we might get two or three, effectively job interviews a month, you know, you're going to audition and 
most people in the corporate world or in other sectors maybe have one, one job interview every two years, every five years. Maybe they stay in a company their entire life. And you know, rejection isn't something that they're hit with on a weekly basis. It is as actors. Um, Gillian says, how do you deal with emotions involved when you don't get... Gillian Jenkins says, thank you for the question. Um, you don't get an acting job that you really want. And then I'd like to also tell the audience about when you've had to reject people in your own projects because you're an actor, but you also produce your own work. Uh, yes, so uh, I mean, re rejection is hard. There's no, there's, there's, there's no denying that. And actually, weirdly, after doing this gig for nearly 15 years, in some respects, it hasn't necessarily got any easier. The rejection, in, in, in some respects, gets a bit harder with more success and um, you know, and, and more, you know, more opportunities coming your way, and, and you know, the, the stakes are raised, and, and that, that, yes, the rejection gets harder. But I, I don't think there's any harm in admitting that. I don't think there's any harm in. I don't think you need to shy away from that. But I think one thing I do keep checking in on myself more and more recently is that. You know, I look at now and I look at a few years ago and I go, well, there's a reason why you're getting in these rooms. There's a reason why you're getting down to the last two. Ray's question, last question, then we're going to throw the ball out. Um, it says, so, so Ray was talking to us last night. He says, how do you say things? It, say, for instance, somebody, give, uh, 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 your line manager, I don't know, or someone above you gives you something, a piece of news or something to deliver. Maybe you've got to lay somebody off. You've got to fire somebody. I don't know. How do you say something? that's hard to say that sometimes you might not even agree with morally or to your standards. How do you deliver that kind of thing in a way that you're still being authentic to yourself? So maybe we talked about on set where you're given a, a line for your character and your character, you, you know your character really, really well. And you might be thinking, well, actually, my character wouldn't say this. Maybe someone gives you something to do and you're like, well, this isn't how I perform, but I don't want to say no to this manager. What if I lose my job or something? Um, and sometimes you've got to get the courage to say, mm -hmm. Actually, I don't think my character would say this in this way. Can we come to some kind of compromise? Or you just, you know, you're effectively delivering that news in a way that is congruent with you, your standards, your morals, in an empathetic way, emotionally intelligent way. Um, what have you got to say around, around that? Yeah, if people are uh, struggling to well, deliver that Well, I think, that I think the example you're giving there, Ross, if when you know, and that's happened to me. It happened to me only only last week. You were given a a, a note or a, or a line. To, to say by a producer, I, I, I sort of completely disagreed with. For me, it was about compromise at that, at that stage. And I could have, I have been the actor on set in the past who has really kicked off about that. And that actually, when you put it in, a, in, the, in the big world to kick off about being told what a line to say is not really that big a deal. Um, so, and I thought, I've learned that now. Uh, and I think you, by, by talking it through with this, with this producer at the time, we both came to an agreement that meant that I, could, I, I felt that I could deliver what they wanted, even though if it didn't 100% sit comfortably with me, I was able to find a way for my character to, to, to respond to it. I, I think you can, you have to work, be prepared to work through these, work through situations like that. I, the, I mean, the, for example, we were talking about something earlier on. Uh, I, other than acting, I've, the last couple of years I've started producing a little bit, short films and moving into a feature soon. But one of the things, a really, really uh, tough call to make um, this, this year, we were, we were um, putting a short film together, our second short, and the, the central figure is, or the central, the lead character is a, is a young boy, set up in Glasgow. And we uh, had cast this young lad who was, who was brilliant, really authentic, um, perfect for the role in terms of a physicality, appearance, all the rest of it. Uh, and we, I, I, I spent, you know, we spent a lot of time with him going to see my personal acting coach. We flew him up and down from Scotland to, to London. We did a lot, I spent a lot of work and we, we, cause we, we needed him to have a huge amount of emotional range, which is, which for any actor is very, very difficult. But for a 12 year old who's not really done anything in front of a camera before is, 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 you know, exponentially so potentially. And we felt that we were putting all this effort in. He was putting huge amounts of effort in, and I could see it was stressing him out. And I could feel that my director, my business partner, it just he wasn't it wasn't quite working. And he, uh, Barnaby, my business partner, said, "Well, look, I think we need to make a call on this because we're getting closer and closer to production, and our lead actor isn't quite at the point we need him to be at." And you know, having been on the acting side for a long time and have lots of rejection, that, that's been tough enough. I'd never thought I'd be in a position where I'd have to sort of, I'd have to let someone go, especially a 12-year-old, a 12-year-old boy having to, having to let them down, let them go. 
And it was, it was a, the, I remember being, I can powerfully believe, I remember walking the dog and, and the whole build up, knowing I was going to be calling this uh, boy's mother in the evening. And the whole day I felt, I felt sick. I felt, you know, I felt with dread, with fear. You know, what the, you know, I was thinking about all these existential problems. You know, how is he going to be on the back of this? What impact will that have? And actually, when I got to the conversation and I was honest with, with, the, with his mother, and I, I said, look, we, I've, and I genuinely believed that he'd come a long way, but I felt he wasn't quite at that point to, to deliver what we needed him to, to, to deliver. And by being honest with his, by, by, by with his, with his mother and in turn him, it was, it was completely the right thing to do. And, and you know, she, her response was, you know, she was upset for him, but she also completely understood. And actually, she was honest enough to say, we felt it was going that way. We felt that that was what was happening. And I, I, I don't think, I, in, difficult, in times of difficulty, I, I think we've got to be prepared to be as honest as possible. Even if, even if there's a part of you that thinks, I, I just don't want to do this. It doesn't quite feel right doing it. But fundamentally, looking back, it, it was 100% it was the right thing to do. And I think you have to be prepared to, to do that. Yeah, I think to tie it in with EQ in terms of the consequential thinking element of it and, and the consequences of, of the situation you're in, a lot of people don't want to have that five-minute burn and that conversation. Mm -hmm. But actually what they're doing is they're bringing the consequence of a three-month or even a multiple years yeah. of pain as opposed to going, if I just get on the phone and I phone this person up and tackle this head on with complete, you know, with empathy, but with complete honesty, that's gonna save me so much hurt and so much hurt for this, you know, as you're talking about for taking that boy through yeah. the process, and he'd have fallen apart during well, the he, filming he, of that. Yeah, exactly, if he'd been on location and been shooting with us and, it would, and he'd capitulated, you know, how that would have felt. I mean, I have been a young actor and things go wrong. I, I, it, can be, it can be a real, Catastrophic situation to be in. So and you, and so I know now that that was the best. That's the best thing for him. You know. Yeah. It's, uh, no, interesting. I love it. And we're going to throw the ball out. Has anyone anybody got anything they want to ask Ed? Um, and I'll I'll try and not destroy the room. Any uh, anybody anybody for anybody? Am I missing anybody? Someone. There we go. I'm not throwing it that far. I'll uh, I'll I'll pop on down. You fill the space, Ed, while I uh, run over here. So do, do sing it. song. Oh God. Do a dance or something. <laughs> 20 questions. Is it, there we go. Hello. Um, my question is about how do you get into a character? Especially I'm thinking about an example, Jack Nicholson, when he played in The Shining, he was really trying to be kind of psychopathic himself. So that requires some managing mm. emotions. Uh, if you have to play an angry character, mm. but you're not angry, how do you get the best state of mind to actually do the best angry character? Uh, I mean, having just played on paper a psychopath, um, I don't think I am a psychopath in real life. I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, I, you, you, f f you, fundamentally, I always have to, I have to, I've used that word a lot, sorry. Um, I have to look at strengths and weaknesses of both the character and myself. I, have, I need to find a way in. So if it's playing someone who is dark and is removed from me, I need to find. I need. To, I also need to have empathy with that character. So it's no different to, to I don't think to EI. I mean, like using the character as a, as, a, as, a, as a real living, breathing human. Now, as I say, there are certain things that I, I I'm not. I, I can't associate myself with that character. But I need to find a way in. So strengths and weaknesses being one. You know, where are we similar? Where we where we, di where, we where we different? What's that character's point of view of the world? What's my point of view of the world? And how can I put my own truth into that? Playing playing using the psychopath as an example. I don't think we. No one plays psychopath. There, you know, there is you, there is learnt behaviour there. Uh, and I think you have to find ways of how does that character use his certain behaviours to get what he wants out of certain scenes, whether it be he charms them, whether he uses aggression, whether he uses um, empathy himself, whether he uses sorrow, whether he uses uh, manipulation, intimidation. And how, how would I, Ed, maybe find ways to, to associate myself in those, in those situations? Uh, another powerful tool f for me, which... Again, I was talking with Steve, and we were talking about it a little bit as well. Is it comes back down to the Meisner approach for me personally? Every actor is different. Uh, Just tell people what Meisner is. They won't know. So, my, so Sanford Meisner was a guy. He trained under. He studied originally uh, Konstantin Stanislavski, but trained with Lee Strasberg, they, who had sort of the whole method school in New York. And Sanford Meisner kind of grew tired of the method idea, the method being very much internal, bring up your own emotions, your own memories, and there, there is merit in some of that, but it becomes very internal, 
And that's why I think actually the more I've been here the last day and listening to other people and, and researching and reading about the EI setup, the, the, the Meissner setup's not too similar because it's about putting out on, onto others as well. It's about the whole thing about listening and responding and being able to, to, you know, to read one another's emotions and, and, and perhaps knowing what they might need in that situation to support them, which in turn is supporting yourself. So, so, so with Meisner, I, I will always, you know, I will try and, but one of the big things with Meisner is about imagination. So it's, it's imaginary circumstances. Rather than having to dredge up horrific things of your past or tragic things of your past, how great or small they might be, it's about, you, we all have a powerful imagination within us. We can all put ourselves in many circumstances based on our own, our own given circumstance. Uh, and and, and it's, 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 it's about that. It's about, which means you don't have to be, you don't need to let it rip you apart as an actor, and th which inherently gives you more, gives it more fun to be had. And, and it comes back down to, to listening and responding again, because Meisner is very much about putting out to somebody, offering something to somebody else, listening to what, seeing what their response is, listening to that, and then, and then translating it and putting it, you know, and then putting it back into another response. May I ask, is it on? Yeah. Um, how easy is it to come back to your true self once you do all that? Uh, it, I, I think it. I think it depends. I think. Uh, I think. Again, if I was, if I was playing a role like I've just played, it, you know, luckily I had a, I had a seven-hour drive back from Glasgow back to Bristol with the dog in the car, which meant by the time I got home, my, my partner and children didn't think I was a raving psychopath. Um, but I think. I think it depends. I think you have to. The, the beauty of the beauty of the imagination and. The, the, the sense of play you can have as an actor is that you can separate the two. There are, there are, there's always, a, there's always a bit of remnants there. There's always a little bit of, uh, of leftovers with with a, with a role to a, to an extent, because you've probably invested so much time in it and you've invested so much time learning about that world and getting inside that character's mind. Um, but that's part of acting anyway. That's part of being. I, I feel being a human anyway. You know, we, we're constantly looking around us and taking in. I think that's potentially why. Not all actors, but have the, they're not necessarily all actually emotionally intelligent, but they have the ability to understand emotions, certainly when it comes to putting characters together, because we're constantly looking around and studying people and, and, and watching behavior and watching how human, the humans interact. Like we're fascinated with the human condition. So I, I feel that we have a good understanding of emotions, but we're not necessarily all emotionally intelligent. Something we could all work on, perhaps. A big thank you. You're going to have to do the voiceover of that next time we play it and dress up also like a lamb, like yeah, he has. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. I always think the part of um, somebody's story where they talk about, I hate to ram it home, but the rejection, the moment where things didn't work out and how you managed to turn it around. I have one very brief question, which is when you get offered a job for a character that you're wondering... How did they see that in me? Yeah. Very briefly, is there ever a moment within you where you have to struggle to adapt and wonder, what have I shown? Uh, is there a dark side of me that they've, they've well, seen? Well, is it wrong to say I get quite excited by that? <laughs> <laughs> you get quite excited? Yeah, if I, if I like playing, because I think for so many years, I've played roles that were uh, like the sort of the, the romantic lead or, or more in, in that in yeah. that line. So suddenly be playing these darker characters. I'm kind of uh, I'm so, yeah, I'm sort of excited by that. And also there is something slightly worrying though. I suppose I have two small children. That those roles have started happening since I've had the children. So I don't know if I'm doing something at home that is making me. <laughs> they open up a world of emotion. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah um, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, they'll be around. And always happy to have a chat, yeah, I believe. Of course. So, Definitely. Ed and Ross, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. you can leap off. Yes, nice one.